Uh, I'm miserable, James. Oh, no. Tell me more. So, (laughs) my air conditioning went out on Friday. And um, we didn't know... Okay, so this, okay, the story starts with my house is in an older development in town, and the city's sewer pipes leading from my neighborhood are all made of clay. Clay? Uh, that sounds like something out of ancient Rome. Yeah, yeah, they're they're old pipes, and uh, so the result is that that trees' roots can can dig through the clay and into the pipes where there's water and so they tend to do that a lot um and because of that uh about every year they get in there so much that water starts to bag up through the floor drain in my house and we had to have a plumber come out and uh like run a snake and it's not a big deal as long as we catch it but if you don't then my office is downstairs and i can have things damaged but it's not that big of a deal. But anyway, so that was done. Uh, that happened on Friday, and we had a plumber come out immediately to do that. Or I should say my landlord, because I'm renting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had a plumber come out and like late at night to do it. Uh, but afterwards, as a result of the water coming up, which it seems weird that this would cause this, but my furnace is right next to my floor drain. And that evening... Uh, there was like a faint smell of burning rubber in the house. And we like looked around and we can't find a source. And I was like, well, that's just weird. Uh, so we went to bed and then woke up in the morning. So Saturday morning and the house was warmer than average. Mm, okay. And the furnace was making like a, a rattling noise. So the, the blower motor, uh, in the furnace, it's blowing in the cold air from the AC just burned out. Which I don't know if it was related to the water or not, but it just seems weird timing. Um, yeah, I mean, chances are that they're both connected, really, isn't it? Good chance. Right. Yeah, so we thought we could make it through the weekend uh, without too much trouble. But we're in, like, a severe heat advisory right now. And, like, the inside of my house has gotten up to 88 degrees, which is, like, 31C. So, On the inside? Oh. Yeah. So it's it's that, very uncomfortably it's un- warm in the house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uncomfortable is putting it lightly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the landlord, uh, oh, so the AC, the uh, AC repair guy called this morning and said we can't come out until tomorrow night to fix it. So the landlord put us up in a hotel in the meantime, so we don't have to really with, with the kids. That's- yeah, was, Generous. Way above, thought... like far and beyond what I would expect a landlord to do, ever. <laughs> well, it's like, hey, we're paying like a, a not negligible amount in rent for a, a five bedroom house, and uh, we're talking about four or five days without air conditioning, and and this is like unreasonable. It's like, okay, I understand you guys. I'll I'll pay for you to be in a. Well, I'll, I'll deduct the rent for the cost of you being in a hotel until it's ah uh, okay yeah. So it's yeah. it's not really out of his pocket. It's just money that he's not going to get. Right. Okay. Um, so we're in a hotel. I was swimming with my daughter all of 30 minutes ago, and now I'm back in this 31-degree house recording this podcast. Oh, uh, you had to come <laughs> back to it for the recording. Yeah. So. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You left the comfort of an air-conditioned hotel with a pool mm-hmm. to come back to a 30-degree house. Just for you, James. Just for me. And our <laughs> listeners, of course. That's right. <laughs> wow, what a week. So, so cu- currently, what day is it? It's Monday for you, and you're expecting the aircon to be fixed when? Tuesday night. Okay. So, And you're in the hotel until at least then? We're in the hotel for tonight, at least. Um, we're not planning on, on staying another night, which may or may not be reasonable, because I feel like even if the AC gets fixed tomorrow night, it's going to take all night for the house to try to catch back up mm-hmm. with it being so hot out. Uh-huh. Uh, but we're going to try to make it work without staying in a hotel. Cause it's not fun to stay in a hotel with four kids, especially less than a one-year-old. And 
I bet it's a real adventure for them, though. It might be something that they remember in oh, 10 years' time. We <laughs> took the kids on vacation this past week uh, to, like, every kid-themed museum and, like, Discovery Center and Play Place, like, anywhere within uh, a two- or three-hour drive from here. We went all over the state for a week and just and just visited everything there was kid-related around here. And at the end of the trip, we asked them what their favorite part of the vacation was, and they said it was swimming in the hotel pool. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Of course it was. <laughs> yeah, so they love this. This is great. It's like when you buy a kid like something for christmas and the best part of the present is the box that the the present came in <laughs> that's right yeah so why why even put so much effort into things when they'll enjoy the smallest smallest stuff yeah which is nice sometimes yeah. depending on how much effort you put in i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah hmm. all right um before we uh jump in can I just give you a quick update of what happened since we last recorded? Yeah, what's happened? Uh, number one is my AirPods case was put into the sink by my child. Right. Uh, number two was my iPhone SE was put into a cup of tea by my child. <laughs> right. Uh, and number three is my my iPad has started to develop, to develop that touch disease type thing that is widely reported on the forums for iPad Pros basically since the pros were announced that they start not registering touches very well, which is incredibly really? frustrating. So three from three. Although the AirPods came back to life. So How did the phone do and the T. Not well. Not really? well at all. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you the, using now? Nothing. I just put my phone SIM card into my iPad because thankfully thankfully it's an LT iPad and mm-hmm. um it has its downsides and it has its upsides. Firstly, I can't receive SMS, like, you know, old-fashioned SMS. So, right. uh, like, the... the uh, I don't re- don't text with anyone anymore. Um, out, you know, it's, it's normally... It's migrated to one of the platforms. Um, mm-hmm. But a lot of the two-factor authentication codes come in via text still. Oh, right. So, uh, when they come in, I have to, you know get the SIM out and put it into something else and get the text, and that's a hassle. This would be a really good use case for pairing an Apple Watch with an iPad. Because I think someone like you, especially who goes long periods without using a phone, if you just had an Apple Watch to get text messages and you could do everything else on your iPad, I feel like that could work well for you. Yeah, if I could pair that Apple Watch with my iPad and have the phone number associated with the Apple Watch, that would be a dream setup. Yeah. 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 Um, but there is another problem. Uh, I do communicate with some people over WhatsApp because they refuse to use Messenger and they don't have an iPhone, so there's no iMessage. And then, like, what else is there? Mm. Uh, and there's no WhatsApp on the iPad, so that's oh really frustrating as well. Yeah, that's surprising because it's a very popular app, especially in like uh, Eastern countries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Eastern uh, European countries. Um, like so you have to use really. You- like ugly 3x iPhone app on your iPad? No, there you can't. They they blocked it. WhatsApp blocks the WhatsApp app from going onto an iPad. Really? You can't even run the phone version. Nope, you can't even run the phone version. The option wow. they give you is to run um like a uh a web version of WhatsApp, but it uses the phone as a relay. So if there's no phone, there's no relay, so that's completely useless. It doesn't work at all. Is a uh, WhatsApp do they have like uh, exposed APIs that like a third party could write an iPad app for? Uh huh. I think they do. And uh, again, it, it has to use the phone as a relay. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, there are third party watch apps. I know that for sure because I've tried them and they they do work, but not oh. without a relay. <laughs> so, are you looking at at replacing your phone in the near future? Then, yeah, I will be. But I'm just so undecided about what to get that. Um, I really like the iPhone SE. Um, right. I think I'll just hang out to find another one. It did take a while to find like a really mint condition one, though. Um, I wonder if so, they show up on Apple's like refurbished site ever. They did a little while back. It's not where I got mine, though. Yeah. And they just stopped yeah. selling them this year, so I feel like they should still show up. 
And I mean, I know the that iOS 13 is going to run pretty nicely on it, but right. uh, do you think they're going to push iOS 14 back onto it? Uh, I I uh, doubt it. Now yeah, that the so how much life? Are the, the lowest supported devices. Right, so they could be on the chopping block next year. Right. But saying that, it's not a big investment for an iPhone SE, so yeah, right. it's, it's probably no problem if I were to buy it. <laughs> Just wait wait another two months and find out what Apple announces. <laughs> it's kind it's of getting a close time. to September, isn't it? Yeah. Two months is almost just a little too long to have to wait. If it was like another month, it feels like it would be more reasonable to say that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, for now, I'm just going to keep carrying my iPad around. It kind of means I have to take a man bag everywhere with me now because I can't put the <laughs> iPad in my pocket. But well, at least you got the smaller iPad. Uh, the smaller iPad Pro. I could right. go smaller. <laughs> How bad is the the touch disease affecting you? Some days it is just like I do not want to use my iPad anymore because it's so infuriating. Uh, and then some days it's just not present at all, uh, which makes it hard because I want to like record it in action so I can take it to Apple and say, look, but there's no way I'm going to Apple without evidence in hand. They will turn uh, you because away they're just... if you can't demonstrate <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Man. They'll turn me away with a, a backhander or something and say, get out of here. <laughs> we've we've never heard of this before, <laughs> despite there being like thousands of posts in the Apple support communities about this particular Sur- problem. Surprisingly, this must have gone completely under my radar because I haven't heard about the iPad Pros having this issue. It's uh, I've heard it peripherally. I've never really looked into it. Um, I've never known any iPad like that I've used or that friends used to have it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. Just just search for iPad Pro Touch issues and you will find uh, mountains, mountains of posts. And is the cause of this similar to what was happening to the 6, where it's kind of being bent so much that connections are being broken? Is that the idea? Um, I don't know, actually. I, ha- I haven't seen any theorizing of what the cause of it is. Hmm. Um. Originally, the problem would happen when the iPads heated up, like if they were fast charging. Oh, okay. Um, that would cause it. Um, and just anecdotally, I think it's worse when mine's plugged into a charger. But uh, I haven't actually scientifically measured that in any way. Well, now you've got me concerned about mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I'm sure Apple's going to honor in it if I can uh, prove that it's happening. Right. Do you have... Apple Care Plus on it? No, I, I've never been an Apple Care buyer because, oh, really? like the the consumer protection in Australia is so good that oh, I mean, the only true. thing I would buy it for is accidental damage. Mm-hmm. Like if I I dropped it, then it'd be very handy to have. But um, like I'm not getting any extra years of support by buying Apple Care. Right. I think that's the same reason I would buy it. I've I've dropped a couple iPhones and it saved me. Uh, uh, like a hundred dollars at least from a screen replacement, and I have I've never broken a new Apple Watch, but I completely destroyed the screen on a Series Two a few months ago. Oh, really? By, by hitting it against a doorknob while I was walking through, and it, it's just completely destroyed. But uh, luckily, I had a Series Four, so it didn't matter. But I've definitely. Uh, I thought you didn't. You already have your Series Four a few months ago. Uh, yeah, I had a. It was a a weird time period where I had sold my series four because I got it free with my phone as a promotion when I switched carriers. So I got another series four and there was like some downtime between when I sold the watch and actually completely switched carriers that I was using an old one. And that's when I broke it. At least it wasn't the four then, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but I've definitely kept Apple care on that for the same reason. Cause I don't want that to happen to me. Uh, on yeah, an expensive new one. Well, I I could have done with Apple Care on my Apple Watch before the screen mysteriously <laughs> broke in like a perfect uh, crack around the periphery of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> when you told me, uh, we sent me the text a week or so ago that that your phone had gotten dropped in tea. I assumed that that was you, but that was your son. That was my son. Yeah, I um, <laughs> <laughs> the phone was on the ironing board. I put it on mm-hmm. my desk to start ironing. By the time I finished my... Well, when I finished ironing my T-shirt, I went into the lounge room and uh, 
there was my phone covered in tea there was tea everywhere and uh, i don't know i'm not sure if he's like has a guilty look he's only one and a half Mm-hmm. Um, it's never yeah and my cup of tea my, my mug that i drink tea out of is like a liter mug so if it went in there it's not like um not like just like the bottom third would it stick in there like it was <laughs> yeah, it was all the way underwater um wow. and also when i took the sim tray out to <laughs> when i took the sim tray out to get the the sim card out um mm-hmm. like tea was leaking out of the sim card tray that's how <laughs> i knew it was it was, uh, yeah, it was gone. So it won't even turn on. It's just dead. Yeah, no, all gone. Oh, that's too bad. He seems to have quite a tech aversion, aversion between the phone and the <laughs> AirPods. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. There's been a fair bit of news in the last fortnight, hasn't there? I'm really excited about what Apple's done to their product lineup. I think we could easily start just by talking about the MacBook Air and then maybe talk quickly about the MacBook and then the MacBook Pro. How does that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first topic was, is Apple updates the Retina MacBook Air, adds True Tone, lowers price to 1099 or... 999 for students and that was submitted by Maltese Apple fan. Hello to all our listeners in Malta. <laughs> Do we have listeners in Malta? I haven't checked, but with a population of almost half a million people, I'm going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> You've got uh, a couple obscure Malta facts. Uh while I was waiting for you to join the call, I was reading the Wikipedia page about Malta once I saw who submitted this article. Malta, uh... <laughs> wow, great start to the show. Malta means probably honey. So uh, Malta is like the, the honey island. Um, hmm. Yeah. All right. What else can I remember? Uh it's the only European country with a Semitic-based language, I guess, compared to, like, Germanic-based and whatever else there is. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it. All right. <laughs> I think I'm out of facts about Malta. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe now we'll have some Maltese listeners. <laughs> no, we paid them some lip service. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe the word will get out there. <laughs> so, I'm really excited about uh, these tweaks to the MacBook Air. I feel like this is probably where the air should have been a year ago when it was first announced, um, starting at around and at a thousand dollars, uh, makes the MacBook air a really good entry level option as evidenced by the fact the previous MacBook air was around for a long time because so many people loved that price point. Um, and even when it was initially announced, this subreddit especially was like, why is Apple using you know, there's like high speed memory or high speed storage when they could be using something more consumer focused and then pricing it more towards consumers, which is exactly what they've done here. The SSD speeds are, I think about 30% slower is what I read, but still completely within the realm of fast enough for the vast majority of people's day-to-day usage. No one's going to notice a slower SSD, but everyone's going to notice the fact that it's priced much more reasonably now. Right, that's how they got the the hundred dollars off, or what was it? Or was it two hundred dollars off? Just by putting in, I mean, lowering the spec of something that I don't think anyone's really going to mind too much. I'm sure there are some people who are like annoyed by this, but there always I mean, no matter what <laughs> Apple does, there's, there's always someone that's annoyed with something. Right. Um, but yeah, the uh, the read speed has gone from two giga. The article I said says two gigabytes per second. Is that how you measure it, though? I would have thought two gigabits per second. Anyway, I'll go with what the article says. Two gigabytes per second dropped from two to 1.3. Um, but the write speed's actually gone up slightly from 0.9 to one gigabyte per second. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, like you said, this um, sort of change is, is probably not going to be all that noticeable in a not pro targeted laptop i think most people are using these laptops for browsing the web 
uh, and stuff like that. Like it's probably a, a machine that runs Chrome and Safari and iMessage for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's a good way to save money and you wonder why they didn't do this to begin with. Um, the True Tone update is cool as well. It's just, it's a nice little touch. It's one of those things that you don't really notice until you go back to something that doesn't have true tone and you're like, oh God, my eyes, like, why are you burning me with this, like, <laughs> blue tone at night? <laughs> yeah, the only time I ever notice it is when I, uh, like, set up a new device and the setup screen's like, do you want to try two tone, true tone on or off? And I always do the test button. I'm like, man, I can't believe that that was how I used my phone for the last 10 years and it never bothered me, but now it's just I'm so used to it. Yeah, and the other time I notice it is when I flick into a photo-based app on the iPad and if they're um, coded properly, they turn off True Tone because, you know, you want right. to see the, the the real colors and you can see, like, the whites turning blue behind all the photos. <laughs> it looks awful. <laughs> huh. So with, with the price drop of the new MacBook Air, uh, Apple's officially dropped the non-Retina model now. So that means the only non-retina computer that Apple still sells is the like decrepit 21-inch iMac still. Is that poor thing still hanging around? I just checked it's still on their website. Okay. <laughs> that has got to be for like point of sale uses where people don't really care. Um, yeah, I mean it's only $200 cheaper than the 4K base model. So I don't understand why you wouldn't pay the 200 for, let's see, an extra gigahertz, uh, single core speed, an extra two cores, and a 4K display. It just makes sense. Is gigahertz the, the singular of gigahertz? I D- believe did so. Did you just say that? <laughs> I, is that not? That's how I've always said it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Does gigahertz have a singular? <laughs> I, I guess we'll gigahertz to... isn't really a plural. Exactly. That's how, what I would have thought. Anyway, <laughs> I like gigahertz. It, I, can, it works for me. That. I don't know what else you would say. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, notably, the the base you, uh, configuration... Uh, is still starting at 128 gigabytes, which, as Razzie M says in the comments, it's seriously starting to feel like those last 16 gigabyte iPhones. I agree with that sentiment as someone who loves downloading all of their content to their devices. Like, my phone has every photo on it. I don't keep anything in the cloud. Or at least I don't keep everything primarily in the cloud like to have physical everything all my music all my photos are on my devices uh but i think for a vast majority of users and the use cases that apple's been pushing cloud storage is becoming maybe more of a primary thing now that your documents folder and your desktop and anything else you choose is backed up to icloud you could function on almost no storage on a computer and still get away with it as long as you get your actual programs installed uh, not that I f- want to defend this lower storage, but I think that it it could be reasonable and usable for a lot of people. I think there's a huge difference between 128 and 256. Like I, I feel that 128 is is not usable for the typical user. It probably covers like five percent of people who who uh, yeah aren't cloud users, by the way. And there are a lot of people who mm-hmm. aren't willing to to pay for that sort of thing and or. People that use Dropbox and, you know, the, the, like the cloud, the smart sync parts of Dropbox aren't very good. And so, you know, even if you're using Dropbox, everything has to be locally on the computer. Um, but yeah, I think the 128, yeah, it just covers way too small a segment of people comfortably. And then the 256 covers like this massive chunk of like most of the rest of the market just to make up some numbers. Like 256 might cover like, 60% of people using it, whereas the 128 might cover like 10% of people who are using it um, without what the is, need to... Yeah? Uh, what is the storage of your iPad? Uh, I've got a 256 gig iPad, and I would always buy 256 gig laptop, laptops as well. Um, right. I mean, even... I'm I'm like full in on the cloud. I would turn on every cloud service, turn on optimize the hell out of everything that you can, 
And even doing that, I always found that I was choking at 128. I was like always hitting it, always having space issues. But 256 was just was perfect as as an all in cloud user. Like the computer, the Mac OS uh, is not great at uh, the optimized part of optimized local storage. And um, <laughs> 256 was an, was enough headroom that I didn't really have issues. Okay, that's fair. Well. I think I think you're right. I think 256 is a more reasonable uh, starting point, and uh, I hope there's not too many people that go into like a Best Buy or an Apple store not so comfortable with computers and just say, "I want, I just want the cheapest MacBook Air," and then be surprised that they can't fit their family photos on it or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels like a price to get people looking at the computer and then they see it's only two hundred dollars to get the two fifty six and then they jump on right. board that. Hopefully there are some um reasonably pushy salespeople around to to get people <laughs> onto that model instead. <laughs> right. Um but as some people know in the comments when you uh when you say it's like a two hundred dollar upgrade to, for two fifty six you also have to remember that it's like actually more like a four hundred dollar SSD at that point. For the 256, which, I mean, even though Apple has reduced some SSD prices recently, $400 is a lot to pay for a 256 gigabyte um, chip. Right. Yeah, Apple likes to really overcharge for storage. (laughs) That's true on all of their devices. The fact that, you know, it used to be doubling your storage was like a flat $100, which is still way too much, especially talking about like, the iPhones when you're going from 16 to 32 or something. Uh, but th- their prices have been steadily creeping up recently where I think doubling, I mean, we're talking about more storage now, but still like doubling your storage can be two to $300 for even iOS devices now. So they, they really like to gouge as far as that's concerned. And they can because their memory's soldered in now, so you can't upgrade it yourself. Yeah, it's, it's one of the few upgrading options left. That's right. Uh, SSDs, I mean, not not memory. Right, yeah, storage, not memory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, just on that same topic, uh, you can now get a one terabyte option in the uh, Retina MacBook Air as well. If you want to pay the $4,000. No, I'm kidding. I'm not sure what the price is. <laughs> Which is technically a downgrade because last year's model you could configure up to 1.5 terabytes which was a weird capacity. Huh, okay, I read that the wrong way around. Ah, so it's yeah. actually a downgrade. I Great, mean, thanks, Evan. <laughs> 1.5 terabytes, I've never seen someone offer that in like a straight SSD configuration. I've seen people offer like a 500 gigabyte SSD and a terabyte hard drive in some computers. But it was it was a weird option and seemed like if you're going to be paying that much, you should be looking at a MacBook Pro and not an, an Air. So I think, I think every update they made helps refine what an Air is and made it more targeted to the correct audience instead of having this weird overlap between their computer lines. And case in point, the other part of the side of the story is that the 12-inch Retina MacBook is no more. It's been killed. You can no longer buy it. It had a good run. Yeah. It was a a loved and a hated machine. I think that's what I texted you. No, I said it was a um, an impressive and an unimpressive machine. Uh, there yeah. were definitely two sides to it. When it, it. The form factor of it, the how small it was, how compact, how light, uh, having a retina screen. Uh, something you could just throw into a small bag. I mean, some people even said like their purse. Like, I don't know what size purse is uh, the people around <laughs> like a satchel, yeah. their carry, <laughs> but, but it's been described as a purse computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, it had, at least the first generation, had a, a truly appalling keyboard. Uh, it mm-hmm. also had the, the really slow processor. I don't think it was until like the second gen that it had like a keyboard with any travel at all, basically, <laughs> and a half-decent processor for its size. Um, I guess those were the main, the main downsides to it. Um, but yeah, it certainly had its niche, and now it's gone. 
I don't think it's gone for good, though. I still feel that we're going to see this form factor come back with an ARM processor in the next year. I was or so. waiting. I was waiting for those magical words. <laughs> it just makes sense. It's such a perfect form factor for an ARM chip. So it feels like it was destined for this. You don't think an iPad Pro with an ARM chip <laughs> and a keyboard does basically everything you could need? I think I think an iPad Pro does serve most use cases. I mean, I'm case in point of that now too. I've I use an iPad Pro and no laptop. So it it does 99% of things I need it to do. Uh but just like the 12-inch MacBook was more of like a a tech demo. It's like look what, what kind of hardware we can do. This is really impressive from a technical standpoint even though it doesn't it's not that impressive from a practical standpoint for a lot of people. I think the idea of bringing Mac OS to ARM could be kind of a similar thing. It's like, look, the super, super powerful, but also low power consumption chip that runs Mac OS and could be a stepping stone for the future evolutions of Mac portables. Just like the 12 inch MacBook design kind of defined how the new air looks now. And you think that they would have like a like com- some of their computers running ARM and another half running Intel, and then the the complexity and the confusion of of having both side by side instead of just uh, like a clear cut over like every computer from this date is ARM going forward. Yeah, that's that's a, a compelling point. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to see a point where they completely transition to ARM. Uh, it's been a while. But I did read some rumors, and this is probably at least a year ago, about how we currently have Intel Macs with ARM coprocessors in the form of like the T2 chip that handles encoding and security and stuff like that. And Apple could be slowly transitioning to uh, kind of changing the balance between those two chips where you have mainly an ARM chip where most of your programs and your OS runs on this super fast, low power ARM processor. And you have this also low power Intel x86 CPU that exists as a coprocessor for the times you still need that architecture for whatever you're doing. It sounds like a sweet idea, but also sounds incredibly complicated to have a transition (laughs) like that. It does sound, it does sound very convoluted. (laughs) Uh, Sure does. (laughs) But... Man, Intel has been so underwhelming with their processors. Well, like the last, man, it feels like it's been like 10 years since Intel's been like, it's probably not been quite that long, but they've been missing deadlines and, and under delivering. And Apple is definitely getting frustrated with this as noted by the fact that the current MacBook Pro chassis was designed around Intel's promised but never delivered yet 10 nanometer chips um so i think i I feel like apple has to be exploring this at least um let's just pretend that Mm -hmm. like arm is not an option like there's just no option there it's it's intel or nothing okay do you think apple got rid of the macbook because like there was nothing that they could do to it there was no like a faster Intel chip that they could put in there and keep it a fanless design. Like there was no improvements on the horizon that they could see coming to this computer. And so there was no point to update it. There's, there's no point in keeping it around. I mean, assuming they're not going to, to go an arm route. I think that is a strong contender for exactly what happened. Um, I said this when the MacBook air was announced a year ago, Apple's, computer lineup was or at least our laptop lineup was really <laughs> confusing and and they had the MacBook Air which was more powerful but cheaper than the 12 inch MacBook and it overlapped with the base of the MacBook Pro and with their streamlining they're like well maybe from a manufacturing standpoint they couldn't cut the price of the MacBook and so without being able to make it cheaper than the MacBook Air it didn't make any sense to exist anymore and so it was just time for it to go uh, 
which I think is exactly what happened, whether or not it's coming back as arm later, because it did not make sense in the lineup. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a perfect summary of what happened. <laughs> so I'm I'm really happy with Apple's, honestly, their entire computer lineup, short of, shy of the awful keyboards, their entire computer lineup right now is, is really strong. <laughs> Well, we can talk about the keyboards in a bit um, because Apple has uh, made another improvement to their product matrix, you could say, by getting rid, well, not getting rid of, but um, kind of bringing an old laptop, a much unloved laptop, uh, up to uh, kind of a modern spec. So, submitted by Chief P- Cheese Puff 7 the base 2019, uh, actually... That headline does not describe what I'm about to describe at all. Um, <laughs> the non-touch bar MacBook Pro with two USB-C ports has been updated um, to have a touch bar and still two USB-C ports. And the article which was submitted is that it's now up to 83% faster than the previous generation in benchmarks. And... That is easy to believe because it hasn't received an update for quite a while. I think the right. last model was actually a 2017 model. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the 2019 model uh, now has the 8th generation uh, Intel processors. Um, it's, it's gone from dual to quad core, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, Touch ID it comes along for the ride once uh, the touch bar is added to the computer. So there's no surprise that it... Um, is faster and that's a given um the part that was a little surprising is that i think most people just thought this computer was going away it's going to die but instead it's uh, it's been given an update uh and it does kind of make the product matrix a bit better bigger a bit better but you do have to remember that it's still not quite a macbook pro because it does have lower specs uh, on the inside and still only two ports right but it does distance itself from the MacBook Air more, and I think that's exactly what needed to be done here. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, and another uh, realization that comes from this is that Apple is going all in on this touch bar. You know, after kind of the mixed feedback they've gotten for the last few years, I at least personally was wondering if they were going to lean into this anymore if they're going maybe going to backpedal and offer some some function key row options in in more models but the fact that they've just completely ditched the function row on all their macro pros now shows that they're still 100 percent committed to this this new design and yet i would not be surprised if the next generation of macbook pros had a physical escape key <laughs> That seems Along to be with the, the point rest of contention, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> For the few weeks that I uh, had a Touch Bar MacBook Pro, when my non Touch Bar was going through its trials, um, mm-hmm. I remember uh, always uh, <laughs> coming to the realization that I always rested my fingers on the escape key because I was forever hitting it. <laughs> For the first week, it was incredibly frustrating because I was just. Putting my fingers down as normal, and it turns out that I just use the escape key to rest. I think it was my my middle finger. Okay, and uh, so that was a bit of a learning curve. <laughs> I've I've gotten extra careful of resting my hand anywhere near the edge of my MacBook Pro, or at least when I use one primarily, um, because wearing an Apple Watch with magnetic clasp always put the computer to sleep when I hit whatever trigger point it was that recognizes the lid closed. <laughs> so I got in the habit of having my arm far away from my computer if I was resting it, like, not on the keyboard. <laughs> what would be interesting is uh, in the 90s, Apple had... Uh, this was an ADB keyboard they made, and it was a, a ergonomic keyboard. that It looked like a standard keyboard, but you could grab both sides and kind of twist them, and they would they'd break apart into kind of a modern ergonomic keyboard layout where they'd kind of be at an angle to each other so you could type at a more natural position. Uh, and that ergonomic keyboard had the weirdest escape key I've ever seen. Every every other key on the keyboard was a standard 
like rubber dome switch key, but the escape key had like a little tactile like nub that said escape, and you had to very deliberately push it. It wasn't part of the keyboard; it was just up in the corner. <laughs> And I could see, I, I, I honestly can't see them bringing that back, but that's how they could bring the escape key back and keep the touch bar full full width right now. So you want a nub of an escape key with the touch bar? I actually think that would make more people angry. <laughs> I think the but it would be right. hilarious as well. <laughs> Let's get rid of the escape key. And you have to like tell Siri if you want to hit escape. Just make it deliberately as hard as possible so people appreciate the touch bar escape key. <laughs> I think we should get rid of the tilde or the back apostrophe, whatever that key up at the top left is next to the number one above tab. Really? Mm, yeah, completely useless, that key. <laughs> well, I mean, I use that key quite quite a bit. Uh, uh, writing JavaScript, that, that, tick, that tick mark is used a lot uh, for strings in, in newer JavaScript syntax. Uh, okay, uh, but I think so. I think that would probably frustrate people as much because I feel like programmers are the ones voicing concern the most about the escape key not being physical anymore. And so I feel like mm-hmm. switching another commonly used programming key for escape would make them equally <laughs> frustrated. All right, I-, I wasn't aware of the use of that back apostrophe. What do you call that? Tick. I wasn't aware of the. Use I call of it a tick. tick. I'm not sure if that's correct or not, but that's what I've always heard it as. All right. <laughs> Now, I think we could get rid of caps lock. I don't use caps lock. Caps lock. Hmm. My caps lock key on my work computer is mapped to control. Uh, and is your control mapped to caps lock then? Actually, to actually activate caps lock, you have to hold control and then hit caps lock, and then it'll turn it on. Okay. It doesn't have a light then on that caps lock key? Uh, No, not on the key. My keyboard has like a separate... LED indicator for if caps lock is on. Uh huh. Okay. So, um, actually, this is this is barely related to what we're talking about. But uh, you know how on MacBooks you have to like really give the caps lock key a good press for it to register. It's got some sort of uh, extra. Yeah. I don't know what you call it. Extra debounce timer or something to make sure that you've held it down to like you really wanted to hit caps lock. Yeah. They brought that to the soft keyboard on the iPads incredibly yes, annoying they yes they it's did. so <laughs> annoying it's <laughs> why did they do that it's not a physical key it's a touch screen <laughs> oh, yeah. every time i hit it i have to hit it twice because it never registered the first time it's uh i'm still not in the habit of actually hitting caps lock i just hit shift twice still from my iphone maybe i should get back on that yeah Cause that, that, yeah, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. That's a pretty sweet little uh, double tab. Yeah, they could almost do the same thing on their physical keyboards. Shift twice for caps lock, and they could free the caps lock key up for whatever else. And then maybe they could fit the escape key up and shift the other two down. To make that yeah, work. Yeah, bump. Yeah, bump tab down, bab, bump tilt down, and then escape key. I feel like caps lock isn't that commonly used of a key. I I, I don't think anyone's gonna miss it. Oh, there is a very uh, niche market of people who are going to use it. It's um, people over 65 who actually hit caps lock and then type the first letter of the sentence and then hit caps lock again to keep typing the rest of it. Do people do that? <laughs> have you come? Yes, they do. Have you not come across them? I have not seen this, no. It's very common. As, is this because uh, any- holding shift and hitting a key is like too hard for them? I'm not sure if it's too hard or if they've just never learnt that, but uh, as an ex- uh, IT technician who saw a lot of people using computers, uh, a lot of people who required help using computers. It is not uncommon mm-hmm. for that uh, that method to get a capital letter. Oh man! See, I, I thought you were going to go the route of of like people over sixty five who use caps lock because it's easier for them to read. Because I've seen that before. Where it's just ah, exclusively okay. caps lock for everything. Uh huh. They write their whole email in caps lock. Right. I've seen it like more on Facebook. And people will say, like, you know, it's kind of taken as shouting when you do that. And like, I do this because it's easier to read. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Have you got anything else to say about uh, the new Touch Bar MacBook Pro? Uh, no, not really. Just that I'm not not with that computer specifically, but just 
I think they've really done a good job of separating their computer lineups now. And there's like each computer serves a specific purpose. And I feel like maybe the iPad is starting to become the product line that's getting a little convoluted. Yeah, it certainly is. <laughs> Especially with the rumors of like some new iPads, like the 10.2 inch rumor that's been going around recently. And mm-hmm. there's some weird stuff. Actually, that's something we should talk about um, before we get off MacBooks is the the MacBook 16 inch. Right. All right. Um, so there were uh, speculations that there would be an updated air this year with like the new design, new scissor switches, mm-hmm. same everything else. Oh, no, probably not same everything else. Um, new scissor switches and a 16 inch screen and, you know, the next generation. I think that was from ming chi kuo the the famous apple analyst Mm -hmm. i think you're right Um, i don't think this update is it by any means i mean it is a 2019 air update um that we're talking about earlier but um it's not a redesign so right and i'd be surprised if we saw another air update this year that was anything like that that would almost make this update of MacBook Air, like the the iPad three of of MacBook Airs, <laughs> right? The, the nine design. month life. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, and I'm surprised because um, it was like very shortly after uh, this rumor that the new MacBook Airs were announced. But it seemed that, uh, in spite of the update to MacBook Airs and the base MacBook Pro, there still seems to be some degree of confidence that we're going to see the 16-inch model before the end of the year. Um, And I wonder if that will be kind of like a precursor. Like, look, this is the new design for MacBook Pro, and this will be trickling down through the product line over the course of the next year. And what if they're getting rid of the Retina MacBook was just making way for this 16 inch and i'm not sure are people saying that's going to be the new air the new pro the new macbook with no um extra word i mean at 16 inches it feels like it would have to be a pro but what if it was foldable (laughs) (laughs) no no way (laughs) no not going with foldable okay you think like a foldable screen Uh uh-huh now, what if, what if they're expanding the touch bar and making it go all the way up to the seam of the display, and they're and they're calling like this new two displays across the fold sixteen inches? Wow. Okay, that could be amazing. <laughs> so it's actually sixteen inches, but the actual width of the laptop is what like the same as the 12 inch macbook and it's just like really long it's like a portrait screen uh i don't know if it could it would be quite that small but yeah maybe closer to the 13 inch or maybe there was rumors a while back of a 14 inch macbook pro i i honestly expect this to be like we're gonna see a 14 and a 16 inch macbook pro and it's just the bezel versions of our current product offerings Right, and the current pros just go away eventually. Or get bumped down the line until they're gone right. eventually. They're probably two or three be, years. Yeah, another three or four hundred dollars for this new model on top of whatever you can currently get, and as the price goes down on those we'll see the other ones phased out. Did you know that a lot of people don't think that Apple's next privacy service should be a VPN? People don't think that? People don't think that. See, when I saw this post, I thought it made perfect sense. Um, Because VPNs are confusing for a lot of people. And they are becoming more and more important uh, for people, at least people concerned with their privacy in any any way to use. Uh, And I, I wouldn't necessarily call this a standalone service. I don't think Apple should offer like Apple VPN that is a program you can download on any computer and use. I think this should just be something built into Mac OS as like a native VPN. I think that sounds exactly like something Apple would do. So are you a VPN user? 
I try to be when I can. I'm I'm having a hard time settling on one. For the privacy part of it, or just to get around geo-blocking? Or... <laughs> uh, no, it's more the privacy aspect. Um, I'm having a hard time s- settling on, on one that works well for me. Uh, but the, the reality is now that anything you do on any device is... You, you know your your internet service provider can see everything you do and and any any like public wi-fi owners that you're on can see everything you're doing and can have access to some devices that are less secure um now i i don't prescribe strongly to this i think i rely heavily on security through numbers um because it's like with like the, the spreadsheet program do you mean <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like with your credit card. It's where card. I save all my passwords. <laughs> <laughs> every every person's credit card number is on the internet. It's been stolen. It's been skimmed. It's 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 floating around. But because there are so many, the chance of your number being picked up and used is very slim. And and that's true with everything. No one no one really cares what I'm doing on my computer. Um and the chances of someone coming across that and and using that information in any kind of malicious way is is so slim that it it doesn't concern me too much um but i also know from a practical standpoint i should be doing everything i can to protect like my privacy and personal information so i've tried how, how does a vpn change that though uh, like, well, whether a, a site stores your information and your access to via vpn or not makes makes no difference Right, I'm not talking about the idea of of like a website storing information and it getting hacked because that's still a real possibility. Um, but I'm talking about the 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 third parties taking my information, like like my internet service provider. Um, without but if, if you were putting in your credit card info, it's probably mm-hmm. an SSL secured site, so your ISP right. can't see that because it's encrypted between you and the website. But they. And this isn't so much protecting uh, personal information like that. It's more like they can't see what I'm doing, but they can see what site I'm on. And they can see usage patterns. And they can uh, potentially target advertisements. You're really making me stretch for this. Because I know, v- <laughs> I know VPNs are a good thing. And I'm not one oh, that, that like... I'm not. I'm not like doing illegal stuff on the internet that I need to like really worry about my privacy. And uh-huh. That's why I haven't targeted uh-huh. a VPN. <laughs> uh, but I still like the concept of people not knowing everything I'm doing at all times and having some modicum of privacy in my own home, no matter what I'm doing. So See, for that uh, reason, yeah. But I don't know. well, I just want to say that I. I would think I would prefer my ISP to have this information than some random VPN company who's, you know, I'd prefer my ISP who I pay, you know, like $100, uh, like $50 a month to rather than some random VPN company that has roots in Russia or wherever to, That's... Uh, who, who I'm paying like $5 a month to or, or $0 because they, you know, they give you a few hundred megabytes for free for the, the few times that you need to use it. That is um, valid, except to my ISP, I am I am David, I live at this address, this is my social security number, this is my credit card number, and this is my internet browsing history. Whereas to a VPN, I'm, I'm user, blah, 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 and this is my internet history. And there's, there's not necessarily that correlation between... Well, the, the VPN provider still knows your IP address they probably know your credit card because you have to pay them in some way they probably have your email address uh, that's true and and if you're not using a service that generates a random card number like Apple Pay and you're using uh, an email address that is tied directly to your personal information then that information can still be uh, like I can't I'm lost, lost for the word right now, but that information can still be tied together. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you're making me stretch. I know VPNs are a good thing. I know privacy is a good thing, but maybe they're not as big of a deal. 
Um, I I think they are not a uh, not important at all. I mean, really, I think the the valid use cases for a VPN are, are way less than what VPN companies make their use cases to be. <laughs> I mean, that's um, that's definitely true. The marketing for VPNs makes it sound like your identity is going to get stolen if you don't use a VPN, right? Which isn't isn't necessarily true, and they're not really going to protect you from that. So, <laughs> I think the valid use cases are. Number one, to get around geo-blocking. Mm-hmm. Incredibly useful. That's probably the only reason I would use a VPN. Number two is when you're on public Wi-Fi and you have to send some personal information unencrypted. Mm-hmm. In that case, you may as well send it um, at least via the VPN provider, at least uh, that far encrypted because uh, mm-hmm. most VPN traffic would be encrypted. Uh, actually, all of it. Um, okay, so let's say yeah. that uh, this Apple VPN offering then it it it's not, it does not the result of them setting up servers in different countries and letting you route your traffic that way, but it is Apple encrypting everything coming and going from your computer, whether or not you're visiting a secure site. That seems like an obvious step they could take. Yeah, to them and then unencrypted from then right onto the the destination. Right. I feel like that is a reasonable step and something they could, I mean, I don't want to say easily implement. That's a, I mean, that's still going to require a a big ramp up of a server to handle like all Mac and iOS users web traffic that way. Um, but maybe associated with like your iCloud fee, like you pay this much to have all your traffic encrypted. I think that still could be extremely valuable for people who are on public Wi-Fi a lot. As Apple, the company that tries not to collect, collect information on people, though, mm-hmm. um, I just can't imagine them doing this because they're going to have to be collecting more information on people by offering this. I mean, they're probably going to have a log of practically everything you visit after that and probably unencrypted too and probably has to be made available to uh, your government. That? I mean, to say they have to collect that... It's not. I wouldn't say they have to, but they it, the information would then become available for them to collect, and they could potentially leverage that if they wanted to. Um, but I think the same is true for Apple Pay purchases. They, if they wanted to, they could be monitoring everything you purchase. And I mean, who's to say they're not? Except their word that you know this is encrypted and we're not storing this information anyway. And they could come out with a similar stance on this encrypted browsing traffic um but yeah it's certainly possible and you'd have to rely on 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 basically just taking their word for it that they're not storing and collecting this in any meaningful way and like tying it to your user id better to take apple's word for it rather than the thousands of vpn companies who also promise the same thing and some who have even uh been exposed to not be keeping their word and are still like major VPN companies, which is uh, <laughs> yeah, says something about the market. Yeah, the i like the idea of a VPN is is almost completely lost if your VPN is owned by or hosted in a the United States, uh, just because of the nature of of our laws. A lot of that information has to be made available to the government. So if if you were really trying to hide something you were doing online. You couldn't you couldn't use Apple because just because of the way the laws are written, the government can't have access to that. You'd have to rely on a company that is uh, based out of a country outside of whatever jurisdiction we have. Yeah, I think if you really want to rena- remain anonymous, like truly anonymous, you have to uh, be on a random Wi-Fi network using the Onion router, something like that. <laughs> Oh, wearing dark sunglasses and a hat that's right so no one can can see it's it's you from a security that's camera right. or something yeah <laughs> i mean the, the the real truth of it is that there's no privacy on the internet everything you do is is documented somewhere either by the sites you're visiting or by the company you're going through or by the computer you're on or whatever else so it's it's just like being in public and you have to keep that in mind no matter what you're doing 
So having said all that, can you recommend any VPN app or service? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this goes against what I had just said about being truly private, but the one that I enjoyed the most so far has been Tunnel Bear. Ah, yes, love it. That's what I was going to recommend as well. Oh, two really? Two. So, yeah. so Tunnel Bear is, is really easy to use for one and they have ios and and mac os and windows and all like applications for everything the issue is they were bought by a u.s company recently so some of that privacy that you like if you're really trying to hide what you're doing from like the authorities you can't do that uh but otherwise in terms of just ease to use and encryption uh yeah tunnel bears has been my my personal favorite because a lot of VPNs feel like they're built for techies, and they're not very pretty <laughs> to use. And I feel like Tunnel Bear is made more for the everyday person. Yeah, you get the little bear who literally like has digs a little tunnel and then pops up in the other country <laughs> from That's a right. tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Apple Park is one of Earth's most valuable buildings, submitted by Elliot AF- AFC. That cool. is... Yeah, not surprising to me. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, what I, what I found more interesting than the article about Apple Park was the link to the chairs they use in the article. Oh, really? I didn't see. Did you see this? <laughs> no. Uh, so apparently, um, Johnny Ive has some friends who are higher up designers and they started this company called Barber Osgerby, Barber Osgerby. And, and their flagship product, the first thing they made was this office chair and they bought, I think it was like 20,000, 12,000 of them. They bought 12,000 of these office chairs to be used in Apple park. And I'm very, very confused by them because they're $1,200 chairs and they, according to the article, about them are designed to promote collaboration. The chair is designed. Right. <laughs> That's how they're marketing. Okay. But they look just like every other office chair I've ever seen. They don't, there's like nothing special about them that they would be. Oh, 12, really? $1,200. Like, yeah, they, they don't look impressive at all. Hmm. <laughs> so that, that was the most interesting thing to me. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got any comment to make about that, except I know $1,200 is like a high-end office chair cost, I'm led to believe, as I right. sit on my office chair I found on like the stream a little <laughs> while ago. <laughs> yeah, I think the chair I'm sitting in was like $50, so. <laughs> I guess I wonder how much it, it uh, that contributes to the value of the building. I wonder, you know, did they count the office chairs? Because at $1,200 each. Uh, there must be a few thousand of them there, at least. Uh, it said that it said they ordered twelve thousand of them. Twelve thousand times twelve hundred. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That is fourteen million four hundred thousand dollars worth of chairs. Nice. Okay. <laughs> well worth it in my books. <laughs> <laughs> so that that uh, extra collaboration is really starting to show as well. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the whole building was designed around collaboration that was a that was a big sticking point of of steve jobs um i don't remember the specific uh company or instance like between pixar and next and and apple but steve like was was well known for like putting departments uh like in between each other where you'd have to like pass other people on your way to doing parts of your day-to-day job because he thought like off the cuff interactions between people was a big part of the creative process. Uh, so Apple Park was kind of designed around that philosophy as well, um, with with the the whole park being set up with both the the inner and outer perimeter is just a walkway around the whole building, so you can get anywhere quickly and easily. And then the big communal dining area, so everyone can kind of get together at once. That was all considered as part of the design and collaboration process so to buy chairs that promote collaboration makes sense with the vision but i don't understand how the chairs do that especially when the article is like in contrast to traditional office chairs which 
are designed to be extremely comfortable to sit in for long periods of time. These it almost makes it sound like they're uncomfortable <laughs> and promote ah, you to get up okay. and move around. Right. Yep. I can imagine <laughs> it now. Yeah, they're just truly <laughs> terrible chairs. Forcing <laughs> you to walk. That really is like terrible, how the article makes it sound. Terrible lower back pain that that can only be resolved <laughs> by walking across to another department. Right. Yeah. Well, so it says like with this this new uh, kind of idea of of hot swapping desks is a phrase I've never heard of before, but that's how they described it. Is like people are always up and and moving around. These chairs are designed for that in some way. Uh, Extra rollability. Well, it it does mention they're quiet. That's like the only feature that I could see mentioned is that they're quiet. <laughs> um, maybe more of a one size fits all. Because I know, like, currently at my office, if someone sits in my chair and adjusts it, it's immediately noticeable to me, and I'll spend <laughs> a few minutes getting it set exactly back to the height I like and the arms right. So maybe it's more a one size fits all design. I don't. I don't know. I have no idea how this promotes collaboration. Maybe there's a yin and yang concept. Uh, like there, there's all the chairs are in pairs, and one puts your back out in one direction, and you have to find the matching chair to <laughs> to reset it back to the middle. <laughs> But then if you stay in that chair for too long, it does the opposite. And so you then need to search down this other chair. <laughs> yeah. uh, my main takeaway from this article is that uh, the building is actually not all that much to look at from the outside. So unless you're in the building or above the building in the air, it's, it's uh, not all that impressive. Yeah, uh, it's, it's case almost too big to appreciate from... Mm, that's right. Yeah. But, uh... Uh, I can concur. I drove past it when it was probably 60% done, I think. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, not much to say about it, really. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's it's massive. Yeah, it's something I definitely appreciate. I, I, I'd enjoy going to visit at some point. Uh, and I, I'd make a point to stop out there if I'm ever in California, but I'm never <laughs> out on the West Coast. Um, so submitted by Roth Hopper, uh, Apple quietly updates Macs to remove Zoom webcam exploit. So if you haven't been following the news in the last two weeks, um, there's a, a very popular web conferencing app platform called Zoom. Um, and uh, they had a few workarounds to, to just make their app run a little bit smoother on your computer because as everyone knows, uh, like... Web conferencing is normally just a nightmare to to get people into, especially non-tech people, which you might need to be training on something. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it turned out um, that Zoom uh, didn't like uh, one of the little prompts that prompted people to um, to like to 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 allow their app to launch. So what they did is they installed a web server on macOS that would like answer requests to from uh, from the from uh, their software to to launch into these web conferences a bit quicker a bit smoother mm-hmm. um and also it facilitated reinstalling zoom so if you uninstalled zoom it would leave the web server running in the background so if you ever clicked on a zoom link again it would quietly reinstall zoom and launch it so you know just 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 the normal stuff that you want to do to to make people's <laughs> life easier right <laughs> um but, uh, sorry, I should have looked up this name, but someone found out that as a result of all this kind of behind-the-scenes work that Zoom was doing, someone could automatically... Uh, someone could serve your website, which automatically launched you into a Zoom meeting with your webcam running with no user interaction, even if you didn't think you had Zoom installed. All it would take was to visit this website. Uh, and they reported it to Zoom, uh, the the 90-day window a reporting window elapsed and then they made it public uh, and anyway to finish this up uh, zoom made a, a a small patch i think but it would only affect people who still had zoom not those people who had already uninstalled it uh, and so apple released a patch as well which was a a, a background install and uh, not something you have to visit uh, the app store for um, using their feature that they occasionally use, I think it's called X Protect, isn't it? And uh, they kind of kind of just push updates to it in the background, and that uh, closed the hole. 
Yeah, when you when you're writing software that deliberately circumvents like built in security, like not only in the browser but in the operating system as a whole, you really should like stop and look in a mirror and and question yourself <laughs> how, how noble your intentions really are here. <laughs> um, it, do you use Zoom? No, no. The company I work for has has very recently decided to start using it, and um, I, I haven't had the joy of being in a web conference since that since that time. See, so we switched over to Zoom at my company uh, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, and and uh, I I have to have it on like I have to have it on my on my PC and I have to have it on my phone, um, but I have avoided putting it on my Mac. Not not for this reason, just because I don't want to put work stuff on my personal computers at all. But now I feel very justified in not doing that. Um but it also makes me like kinda wonder what other workarounds like what else Zoom is doing behind the scenes, not only on Mac, but what are they doing on Windows? Uh which in some cases has a little bit more lax security policies and potentially doing some other things that might not be malicious per se, but allow for malicious activity like this. Uh, basically what they've done is deliver a, a Trojan onto people's computers with really, this yeah. sort of practice. I mean, and, and this is, is is probably negligible, but even the act of just eating up your computer performance by running a server at all times, even when you thought you've completely uninstalled the program, is... I mean, that's like the definition of a virus. So it reminds me of like Adobe, you get, like you install Creative Cloud and then you uninstall it and then you check back like three weeks later and you still have 40 Adobe processes running. <laughs> it's that sort of nonsense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Their their intentions might have been good to make it easier to to get into a conference. But with this sort of practice, you know, you just surely they they didn't think that this was going to remain a secret forever. The fact that they were doing this, I mean, let alone that it was easily exploitable. Yeah. I mean, of of course they knew about it because they, uh, at the very least have known for the last 90 days. Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and apparently just were not concerned about it until the negative press in the last couple of weeks. Uh, what do you think about, uh, Apple silently updating things like this in the background with, no user in, uh, interaction. Uh, I think I think this is a plus. Uh, there's a lot of users who don't get around to doing uh, software updates or OS updates as frequently as frequently as they should. And I'm I'm definitely guilty of this. My personal PC has been giving me a pop up to update Windows for like the last couple months. And I always hit remind me later because if I'm using my computer, then I want to use my computer. I don't want to update. And that's the only time I ever see the the mm-hmm. notification. Um, I'm sure there's people that are e- like even worse, like people who are years out of date on their, on their operating systems. And while the idea of making changes to your computer without your permission or even your knowledge is, is potentially scary in the hands of some companies like zoom, uh, I trust Apple enough uh, to handle that power. Like with great power comes great responsibility. I trust Apple to handle that responsibly. Uh, and I think this is a, a, a perfect example of a, a case they should do this to protect people who otherwise wouldn't update their operating system. I wonder if X-Protect also um, would solve the problem on like the last three, four versions of macOS as well because you know they're not getting software updates anymore. So does that yeah. limit Apple's ability to to send out security updates like this? If I mean, is expect the only way that they can deliver security updates? Although I know that um, security updates have been delivered to to old OSs, like mm-hmm. when it's been needed in the past, when they haven't actually had any point updates uh, for a while. See, I feel like it's been a it's probably been a couple years now, but it feels like it was fairly recently that Apple pushed like a security update to like Lion or something. It was like a ridiculously <laughs> yeah. outdated operating system. And it was, 
uh, kudos to them for when they have like a, a major security vulnerability to support people who potentially can't upgrade to the newest operating system to keep them secure in their older hardware is uh i mean apple's always been great about supporting old machines like that uh, and the, the last part of this story i would say is um ios users of course are not affected so that little <laughs> trade-off of uh not really having an open platform does sometimes have its advantages such as this one i will say the zoom carplay app is terrible uh, <laughs> what <laughs> really <laughs> They have a CarPlay so, app. Yeah. So, I mean, as someone who uses Zoom for meetings, like we we Zoom every single day, and I don't use it most of the time, but if I'm running late to work or I'm working from home, I'll Zoom into a meeting. Um, so, like, if I'm driving to work and I need to get into a meeting, I will use the Zoom on my phone, and it has a driving mode actually in the Zoom app uh, to minimize distractions while driving, and you, it's like a tap to speak uh, functionality, which it works great, uh, but the car the car play app for me just doesn't work at all. Like it loads up a black screen, so <laughs> uh, at least they tried. <laughs> they tried. Maybe, and, maybe the maybe the they left like the part that tries to install like the web server on, um, and it's trying to do that in CarPlay somehow and just <laughs> and start on failing completely. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't I haven't any luck with that, but the actual phone app has its own driving mode, which is nice. Neat. Yeah. Well, I'm James VDM on Reddit and Twitter if you want to find me and ask me any questions. And I'm Jelly Woot on Reddit and Twitter. Don't ask me any questions. Only only follow me if you want to see tweets about video games or something. I don't know. I don't tweet very often. I, I, oh man, I just hate Twitter. Every time I go in there, I come away angry. So, oh, really? especially since they promote, like, uh, you know, if you follow someone and then it, it gives you tweets from people that they follow, you know, like the people you follow. Or right. I can't remember what it's called, but I mean, yeah. I really like my curated list of people I follow and I just hate seeing, I don't hate seeing other people's stuff, but often it's just stuff that... I don't want to see and stuff that makes me angry and hmm. yeah maybe that's just I, me <laughs> I have the opposite experience um uh-huh I don't I don't use Facebook for that reason um like I, I mean this sounds I, I'm not hipster I mean, like I'm younger than I am to say that like Facebook is for old people uh but like it was fun in like high school it was just friends and then when your parents and grandparents get on there and I mean it's not like I have things to hide from my parents and grandparents on Facebook but I don't necessarily want to see their opinions on things uh, so here's, here's my use case of Facebook and I use Facebook yeah. a lot but okay, I mean the, the news feed itself is just garbage it's like 80% yeah. ads uh, right. like the posts on there are from people I you know haven't seen in 10 years or whatever um, but the reason I use it is for groups. It's like having like a mini Reddit kind of, but better in some ways. Um, like I'm in like analog photography groups of um, like the, the Australian one, and then there's the Perth one. It's um, just a good place to connect with people with like-minded people that is a little bit more. Uh, more uh what would you say like geographically aware like reddit is just mm-hmm. so i mean of course you can make like a a more niche subreddit but um i don't know P- people seem to be on board with the whole groups thing when it comes to facebook and i think facebook's aware of it like every time they release an update it seems to be kind of pushing groups to the fore um yeah so that's my use case of facebook uh yeah, I think I'm in somewhere boat. I have a few Facebook groups, but I'm still around for and the marketplace. If I'm oh, the marketplace. I open the Facebook yeah. App. yeah, I'll go on the marketplace. Um, I had the interesting experience of I'm I'm in like some uh, like vintage computer collecting groups, and uh, I was talking with this guy on one, and uh, discovered 
via the nature of Facebook that we were in the same town, uh, which is probably not something I would have found out on Reddit. But not only that, it turns out we worked at the same company and, and uh, just had never <laughs> run across each other before. <laughs> so that's kind of a cool Facebook experience. Um, honestly, if it was just that and the, the idea of like timelines and, and news feeds and all of that was was completely stripped out, I think that'd make a better experience. Mm, yeah. The, so. But the thing that Facebook was originally about, like the friends, is is kind of just on Instagram now. That's where I follow yeah. my actual friends and where I keep up with what they're doing. Right. Yeah, I try to I try to have this like I'm trying to have a distinction between Instagram and Twitter for me. Whereas like Instagram is is more I don't know if serious is the right word, but like sincere. There's like I share updates about my life and my family. And then Twitter is like just the random thoughts I have that I want to share with people. Like like Instagram, I'll put photos of my kids growing up. And then on, on Twitter, I'll put a picture of the video game I just completed. And that's how I differentiate between the two. Instagram is where I go to be happy and Twitter is where I go to be angry. And Reddit's, <laughs> I, Reddit's where I go when I'm bored. I don't have that experience, but... But uh, maybe you're just following the wrong people on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the thing. I'm following the right people. The people I follow make me happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's Twitter. <laughs> Twitter giving me all this other like peripheral stuff that. Yeah. Is anyway. is there no way to, to turn that off? Like, see posts that friends like. I could probably just not use the the Twitter app. I'm sure, like the other Twitter apps, don't have that feature. I mean, I don't know for sure, but... You just got to use uh, Chirp for everything. Uh, that's a watch app. <laughs> yeah. Oh, of course. You don't have a watch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could try and install it on my Casio, but I don't know. I don't know how many, like, 40 little <laughs> LCDs can display. We'll uh, we'll send send Will a feature request for yeah. it to run on Casio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll do. 